Well, hello and welcome to the rules explanation video for 18 Chesapeake. Designed in 2019 by Scott Peterson and produced by All Aboard Games, this title is designed to be a great introduction to the 18XX system. 18 Chesapeake is set in the Chesapeake Bay region of the United States, west to Ohio and the West Virginia coal fields. Two to six players represent investors in railroad companies spending their initial capital by wholly owned private companies and later shares in public companies. 18XX is the name for a genre of board games that feature the creation and operation of railroad companies, which generally are set in the 1800s. The landscape of 18XX games includes many different titles, usually with rules differences from one game to the next, giving each game its unique flavor and play style. The rules have been written and edited to be good introduction for players not yet familiar with the 18xx style games. They are written in chronological order and are sectioned accordingly for easy reference during your game. Now let's move on to setup. Begin by placing the board in the center of the table. Place the share certificates on indicated spaces on the board with the 20% president share on the top. Note that the 30% share is only used in a two-player game. Place the privates near the board, starting with P1 at the top and going all the way down to P6 at the bottom. Next, place one share of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad underneath P5. Then randomly select one of the eight companies, in our case it was the CNO, and place the president share underneath P6. Place the company markers and charters nearby. Place the trains in their place, organized in ascending order by value. Sort the track tiles by color and type and place near the board. You will start with yellow and advance through the other colors later as the game progresses. Place the round marker on the stock round space. Set up a bank which totals $8,000 using the money provided or your own substitute. We tend to use poker chips around here. Give each player their starting capital using the chart provided on the board. Using the player cards, randomly choose a seating order and a player to have the priority deal. And then you are ready to begin with the private auction. There are two types of corporate entities in 18 Chesapeake, private companies and public companies. A private company is a small company which will generate money for the player who owns it. It may be sold to a public company in the future to grant its benefit and income to that public company until it is closed at a later time. A public company has 10 shares that are available to be bought and sold by other players. The player who opens the public company is deemed its president and will have control of the company as long as they have control of the majority of shares in that company and has the president's certificate. The presidency may change hands at any point during the game when this condition is no longer met. A real quick word on company funds. It is an important distinction of 18xx style games that a company's money and a player's money are completely separate. A company has its funds that are kept in the treasury located on its charter. Be very careful not to mix this with other companies' money or your own personal funds. Now that you know a little bit about the companies, we're ready to begin the private auction. At the beginning of most 18xx games, there will be a one-time private auction. This occurs and then the game will start with the stock round once the auctions are complete. Starting with the person who has the priority deal marker, a player may buy the lowest number of private available at the cost listed in the lower left-hand corner of its certificate. They may pass or they may place a bid on any of the other available privates. They must bid $5 over any previous bids. In my games, we usually use company tokens for each player to note who has bid on what items. You may never bid more than the cash you have on hand, and you have to be able to cover all of your bids at any given time. When the lowest private is purchased at face value, the player who purchased it pays the bank for it and is given the certificate. Next, you need to evaluate the next lowest private. If it has no bids, then the bidding continues with the next person in order. If, however, there is a single bid, 
that player pays the amount to the bank and takes that private. If there is more than one bid on the private, it is put up for an immediate auction only with those who bid on it originally. This auction takes place starting with the person who bid the lowest. Once a player passes, they are not allowed to bid again, and the winning player will pay for the private and takes possession of it. Continue to the next private until all of them are either sold or until the lowest has no bid. Once bidding is complete, you will commence with your first stock round. Special note though, whoever wins the P6, the Cornelius Vanderbilt auction, must set the par price of the company associated with this private. Mark it by placing the appropriate marker for the company in the desired par value box on the board. We'll cover what that means in a moment. There is a rhythm to 18xx games with a stock round followed by a number of operating rounds, usually depending on the phase you are in and the game being played. A stock round is the time when you can open new companies, sell shares in existing companies, and purchase stock in other companies already in play. The term certificate limits are common restriction in these games and help govern how many pieces of paper you may have at any given time. It is typically determined by player count, so refer to this chart to see what the limit is. A certificate is a single piece of ownership you have in a company or private. They should not be confused with a share. The private company, president certificate, and a 10% share are all examples of a single certificate. You may not purchase shares if you are at the limit without first selling other shares first. There are other restrictions on shares as well, such as a player may never own more than 60% of a company. The bank pool may never have more than 50% of a company in it. Private companies may not be sold to the bank, and a president's share may never be in the bank. You have a few options during the stock round, and the order is important. You may sell shares that you possess. You may buy a single share or the presidency of an unopened company, or you may simply pass. Players may pass on their turn and re-enter the round at any time while the round is going. The stock round will end once all the players have passed consecutively. Players may sell as many shares of a company as long as it doesn't break the 50% rule and it has operated at least one time. They receive the market value for all of the shares sold and the prices drop down one row in the market per share sold stopping on any ledges it may encounter. It is important to note that once you sell a share in a company, you may not buy that company again this round. If this causes someone else to have more shares in a company, they become the new president and exchange two of their 10% shares in the company with the person holding the president's certificate. They now have control of that company. In the event two players are tied for the most shares, the person closest to the left of the current president receives the president's share. If there are any 10% shares available and the presidency has been purchased, the player may buy the 10% share. Simply look up the par value for that share, pay that amount to the bank, and take the share. If, however, you wish to purchase a share from the bank pool, those will be sold at the price indicated on the stock market pay that amount to the bank, and then you may take the certificate from the bank pool. If the president's share is available, you may buy the 20% president's share. When you do, you must declare the par value for the actual share itself. This number will determine a few things we'll cover in a minute, but right now it will also determine how much each share is going to cost. The player purchasing the president's share will pay double the amount that they parred the certificate at since the certificate itself counts as two shares. Now let's talk about floating a company. Once 60% of a company's shares are sold out of the IPO, the company will float. This is the term we use for when a company is able to operate and will receive its funding. A few things happen when a company floats. The company receives 10 times its par value into its treasury. You then place its stock marker on the stock chart equal to the value of its declared par value. If there are any other markers in that space, place it on the bottom of the stack. 
The president receives the company's charter and places the tokens in the appropriate spaces on the charter. The home station marker will be placed in its home location on its first round of operation. The end of the stock round occurs when all players have passed consecutively. The priority deal is given to the person who was left of the last acting person. Eh, we call it Lola. <laughs> they will act first in the next stock round. If a company is fully held by players not including shares in the open market, then the company rises in value on its good fortune. We note this by moving its stop marker up one row. If it is already occupied, then place the marker on the bottom of the stack that is already there. Depending on what phase you are in at the end of a stock round will determine the amount of operating you'll have. You note what round you are in by the location of this marker. Now, let's take a minute to talk about the different phases. Phases represent the march of progress. As trains are purchased or removed during the game, time and progress move on. We start our game with inefficient trains capable of reaching only two cities, and at the end of the game, we're running diesel locomotives that are capable of traveling clear across the map. The phase you are in is determined by the last train purchased. Phase one is complete with the conclusion of the first stock round. We begin in phase two, and when the first three train is purchased or exported, phase three will begin. Phases unlock different options that companies such as upgraded track options, as well as opportunities to purchase the private companies in. But they also come with some consequences in the form of how many trains a company may own, or may even cause older trains to rust and be removed from play. Use the chart provided on the company's charters themselves and in the rules to help you know what is going to happen and what will trigger the change. The first part of every operating round is to pay the holders of the private companies any income they are due. That could be either players into their cash reserves or companies into their treasuries. Do note that all the private companies close when the first five train is bought. Determining which company operates first is determined by the highest value company, which is the box that is in the highest row, first to the right of the highest value in top to bottom order. Once a company is operated, move its token as dictated by its actions and flip it upside down then move on to the next company. During a company's operating turn, it has to operate in a very specific sequence. And that is, it will lay or upgrade one track tile, it may lay one station marker and pay for it, it will then run its trains, pay any dividends, and then buy trains. At any point during its turn, it may buy private companies from other players or the owning player itself, but it may not buy private companies from other companies. So let's talk a little bit about laying track. Laying track is how we upgrade paths. It's also how we increase the value and open paths to closed off routes. The game board consists of a grid of hexagons that feature revenue centers located throughout the board. There are previously printed track and tiles already on the board. The black arrows on the red tiles and on the pre-printed beige tiles represent existing track and may not be upgraded. However, the two yellow pre-printed Philadelphia and Baltimore locations can be upgraded once the green phase is unlocked. There are several different components on the board. There are red off-map areas that exist there are pre-printed track routes. There are mountain hexes. The river hexes you must pay the fee associated with there, but only the first track that is laid on the tile is counted. So when you upgrade it later, you no longer have to pay that fee. The same goes for the mountains. At the beginning of the game, the only tiles available are yellow tiles. Whenever a company first operates, it must lay its home token. If there is no place to lay its home token because no tile exists, you must first lay that tile 
and then you may lay its home token. If the tile you are going to also contains a city, then you must place a city there as well. Note that DC has pre-printed tiles already for this purpose. Towns are located throughout the map and are symbolized by the small solid black dot. We recognize that on newly placed tile by placing the tile that has the bar located on the track. When placing tiles that have two towns on them, you must use the appropriate tiles. There's only a handful of these, they don't upgrade, so their placement can be very critical, especially up here in the Northeast Corridor. In addition to Washington, D.C., there are two locations on the board that require special tiles to be built on them. They are denoted by the OO in Baltimore and in Philadelphia. The only tiles that may be placed there are the ones that are designated with the OO on them. Note that when you lay tile, you may not lay illegal tile to mean you must always maintain whatever is below that tile, and you may not run off the boards except where pre-printed arrows allow you to do so. Note that there are several locations on the track that feature these dots and lines. These hexes are controlled by the private companies that they represent. These hexes may not be built until that private company has been purchased by any major company. Whenever you are upgrading a track, you must follow the correct upgrade path. So note that yellow tiles will upgrade to green tiles. Green tiles will be able to upgrade to brown tiles. And while there are only two in the game, brown can upgrade to gray. Note that the increased revenue that is associated with these tiles shows the progress throughout the game. Thus, a city that starts its 20 value can grow to a value of 50 by the end of the game. When you're upgrading a tile, it's important to know that you must maintain the integrity of the track that already exists. So when laying this track, I must lay a track that will still connect those two endpoints. Another thing to point out is that when placing tile, I may upgrade a tile even though I'm not able to reach it at this time, if the result of the upgrade will allow me to reach that tile. Henceforth, the PLE cannot reach DC at this time. But if we upgrade DC, the PLE is now able to freely reach and run to DC. Now this is a great time to talk about station markers. Station markers allow your trains to run to and from points, and they also can be a blocker to other people who are trying to run through certain locations. Because a train may not pass through a token, it would be a wise decision for the PLE to place a token, paying the cost for it, in the DC area. That way, it will always be able to run either to or through Washington, D.C.'s hex. If the Baltimore and Ohio decides to place their token there as well, they are the only two people who can run a route through that station. Now the company has the chance to place a station marker. To find out how much the token costs, simply look at the charter. The price is below the token you are about to remove. Simply pay that cost to the bank and you can place the marker. To do so, it just must be able to reach the new location by track. It doesn't matter if it has the train length to do so, it just must be connected by track from one location to the next. Now, let's talk about running trains. If a company has no trains, as it will when it first operates, you will skip this step. This is where you will generate all the income for both yourself and for your company. So it's very important to run efficient routes. A route consists of at least two different revenue locations that are connected by a track. Each route must have at least one of the operating company station at some point along its length. Multiple trains may utilize the same station in its route provided it does not utilize the same physical track. The number of revenue locations in a train's journey may not exceed the range of the train, denoted by the number of the train itself. A route cannot contain the same revenue location more than once, including the red off-board areas. The red off-board locations count as a city for the purpose of counting how many revenue locations a train can include on its route. 
If a company owns more than one train, the routes they run must be completely separate. The routes may meet or cross at revenue locations provided they use separate sections of track. Calculating a train's income. The revenue of a train is the sum of the revenue values for each location on its route. The revenue of a company is the sum of the revenues of all of its trains. The revenue value for each city or town is printed on the tile or hex. The red off-board areas have different values in the different phases of the game. Note that they are color-coded so you know how much the route will be worth. Now let's take a look at actually running a route. The PLE has two trains at this time. It came out of Pittsburgh and has laid two tokens. Those are going to be very handy because we're going to be able to run our two train from Green Spring over to Ohio for a value of 30 plus 60 for a grand total of 90. Then it will run its three train from Green Spring to DC and to Baltimore. Note that even though BNO's tokens here, it can end its movement in Baltimore. However, it cannot progress through Baltimore as that token is blocking its journey. The total for this trip will be worth 40 plus 40 plus 30 for a grand total of $110. We add that 110 to the 90 from its two train giving us a total of 200. We note that on the revenue chart over here by placing the extra token it has on the 20. Now down the side, you'll see the amount of payout should we decide to pay out this money and we own 60% of the company, we will receive $120 into our personal funds. If it decides to withhold, all $200 will go into the company treasury. We then will adjust its stock marker by moving it forward if it paid out dividends and flipping it over. If a company is not at the current train limit, which is denoted by the phase you're in, it may buy trains, however many it can afford and hold, either from the bank at face value or from one of the other companies that you own for any value greater than $1. Every company that has a route must have a train. If the company cannot afford to purchase a train from the bank and it does, does not wish or can't purchase one from another company, then the emergency fundraising occurs. The president must pay the remainder of the next available train from their personal funds. If the president does not have enough cash, it must sell enough stock to raise the funds necessary to cover the amount owed. This may cause other companies to change presidency. Also, for each share sold, the stock price of the corresponding company will fall by one box. It will come to rest on any ledges. If, after selling all of the stock the president is able to, abiding by all the rules of stock sales, meaning no more than 50% in the bank, and no president shares in the bank, then they are declared bankrupt and the game ends immediately. If they are, however, able to pay for the train, it is placed into the company. Note that there should now be zero dollars in the company treasure once this is completed. Like we said, any time after phase three, meaning once the first three train is purchased, you may buy in privates into the larger companies. It can be purchased for cash from $1 to double its face value. From now on, that private will be owned by the company, its revenue going into the company, as well as any benefits that may be associated with it. When your round is complete and all companies have operated, advance the round marker. If you happen to be at the end, and you go to a stock round next, you must export a train if you are in the yellow or green phases. To do this, simply remove the train that is on the top of the deck. The next thing to do is to reset all the tokens. Simply flip the tokens over in place. When you encounter a stack, flip the entire stack over so that it remains in order. The game will end in one of two ways. Either somebody has gone bankrupt or the bank is going to break. If the bank breaks during an operating round, finish out that set of ORs and then the game will end. 
If it happens during a stock round, then you will play one set of ORs and then continue to pay out as normal using IOUs or anything to track additional funds. A player's net worth is determined by adding up all of the cash that they have on hand, private companies are traded at face value, and the value of all of their stock traded at the current market value. And the richest player wins. So there you have it, 18 Chesapeake. What a great introductory 18xx game. I am sure you will have many, many plays of delight if you choose to play this. Now there are different rules for a two player game, so do be sure to check those out in the rule book if that is a way you'd like to play. It offers some very interesting and different choices. So until next time, have fun playing train games.